All right, tropical storm is going to be classified as major if it has sustained winds greater than 110 miles per hour. Based on data from the past two decades, a meteorologist estimated the following percentages about future storms. They found 20% of all tropical storms will originate in the Atlantic Ocean, of which 20% will be major. 30% of all tropical storms will originate in the Eastern Pacific Ocean, of which 15% will be classified as major. And 50% of all tropical storms will originate in the Western Pacific Ocean, of which 25% will be classified as major. Okay, so based on the meteorologist estimates, approximately what is the probability that a future tropical storm will originate in the Pacific and be classified as major? So a good way to set up this problem is to create a tree diagram. This will give you a good visual of what's going on. So you can either have a storm coming from the Atlantic Ocean or the Eastern Pacific or the Western Pacific. I'll put the corresponding probabilities on here. So 20% chance from the Atlantic, 30% chance from the Eastern Pacific, and then 50% chance from the Western Pacific. And now if within each ocean, the storm could be major, we'll write that as an M, or non-major, or we'll just say not major, or N. So each of those breaks off into two branches. And we write down the corresponding probabilities that we're given here. So for the Atlantic, 20% of them are major, so we put point two there. In the Eastern Pacific, 15% are major. 0.15 there. And then in the Western Pacific, 25% are major, so we put 0.25 there. And so we're trying to find, you know, what the probability is that it'll come from the Pacific and be classified as major. So it could either be Eastern Pacific and major. So we could have either, you know, we could have the Eastern Pacific, so we'll put EP and it's major, or it could be Western Pacific and major. So the probability of Eastern Pacific coming from the Eastern Pacific Ocean and being major is just use multiply those corresponding values. We got 0.3 times 0.15. And likewise, to find that the probability that's from the Western Pacific Ocean and then it's major, you were going to go 0.5 times 0.25. So you multiply both of these and you add their values together. It's The point seventeen. So your answer will be C. All right. Research indicates that the standard deviation of typical human body temperature is 0. 0.4 degrees Celsius. So, which of the following represents the standard deviation of typical human body temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit is given as nine fifths times C plus thirty two. Okay. Now. This is an example of transforming random variables. So when you have um, a variable that you're changing from, you know, let's say from variable X to Y, and let's say that, let's say that um, Y would be equal to 10 plus three X. If you want to find the mean of y, that value would be 10 plus 3 times the mean of y, the mean of x. But if you want to find the standard deviation of y, you only focus on the multiplication. So it would just be 3 times the standard deviation of x. So since we're trying to find the standard deviation, all we have to do is, is worry about the multiplication here. See, we're multiplying and adding. But since it's standard deviation, you'll have to do the multiplying. So it'll just be 9 fifths times the standard deviation of C is point. So 9 fifths times 0.4. So the answer would be B. Right, the distribution of weights of female college cross country runners is approximately normal with mean 122 and standard deviation. Eight pounds, which is falling as the closest percent of the runners who are between 114 and 148 pounds. Okay, so we're essentially just going to look at the, the area found in the normal distribution with the mean of eight, or mean of 122, standard deviation of eight. So um, 114 and 138, so 
to the left, 114. It's the right, 138. So you want to find essentially this area. Right as probability. So for this, you can use your calculator. You can go to the distribution function, go to normal CDF. Now for this calculator, you're gonna to have to memorize the syntax. It goes lower bound, which is gonna be our 114, comma upper bound, which will be 138, comma the mean, 122, comma the standard deviation, which is eight. And I'll give you, I'll give you that area. So about 0.818. So it'll be about 82%. If you have a more advanced calculator, it's probably gonna be easier, but it'll probably just tell you like, probably list lower bound, upper bound, standard deviation mean. These ones you have to memorize, so just be aware of that. All right, for 10, um, the measures of water quality were taken from a river downstream from an abandoned chemical dump started. Concentrations of a certain chemical were obtained from nine measurements taken at the surface of the water. Nine measurements taken at mid-depth. Okay, so nine, nine measurements taken at the surface, nine measurements taken at the depth, and then nine taken at the bottom. 27 total. So what type of study was conducted? What is the response for the study? So this is going to be an observational study because we didn't do any, um, we didn't impose a treatment on any variable. So we're, it's going to be an observational study. So we're not, it's not going to be A or B. We know that. We'll cross those out. Definitely not senses. So it's going to be D or E. Now, um, the response variable is essentially what we're trying to measure, what we're trying to you know, understand. So we want to understand the concentration of some chemical. The depth is basically that basically because we're taking it from like different, um, you can know, think of like um, different groups. Like so let's say you want to measure the, the average height of, you know, a high school student, you would have, you know, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. That would be like your four groups, but you're still measuring height. So the answer would be D. All right, 11. Ecologists want to estimate the mean biomass of a certain forest or region. The ecologists divided the region into plots measuring one square meter each, and they selected a random sample of nine plots. The mean biomass of the nine plots was 4.3 kilograms per square meter, and the standard deviation was 1.5 kilograms per square meter. Assuming all conditions for inference are met, which of the following is a 95% confidence interval for a population mean biomass? Okay, so um, we're doing 95% confidence interval for mean. So let's recall like what our form would be. We have our point estimate will be x bar plus or minus and our critical value would be our T star. Then it'd be multiplied by our standard error, or um, in this case, the formula would be the sample standard deviation. So S sub X divided by the square root of N, square root of the sample size. You usually are going to be given, you know, a formula sheet. This is the one that using the textbook that I teach with. And so become familiar with it because you're also gonna sometimes wanna use or use the need to use a table. But anyways, um, it's not given to you straight up like that simply, but it's given to you in some form like, like this. Critical values usually gonna be T star or Z star. Standard error will depend on the, the statistic that you're, you're using and the parameter you're trying to estimate. So, um. We go here saying so we're looking to see at means. So that's our standard error. Sample standard deviation by the square then. Anyways, um, so X bar would be 4.3. T star, we have to look at the corresponding T value where, where we have the 95% confidence interval of a sample size of nine so our degrees of freedom would be nine minus one or eight. So go into your table. My calculator doesn't have the, the, the function to straight up calculate it. Some calculators do, but 
And anyways, you would go to degrees of freedom eight and see 95% common interval right here. So we look at this row or this column, zoom across and our value would be 2.306. So our TSAR would be 2.306. Sample standard deviation, was 1.5. And that'll be the square root of nine, which is just three. So not this, it would be E, our answer would be E. All right, so we have staff members of a high school newspaper. They want to obtain an estimate of the average number of years teachers in the state have been teaching. Educational conference attended by many teachers in the state. And educational conference is attended by many teachers in the state. The staff members randomly selected 50 conference attendees and asked the attendees how long they've been teaching. Which of the following describes the sample in the population to which would be the most reasonable for the staff members to generalize the results. All right, so um for a sample are you know going to be obviously 50 randomly selected conference attendees. So it's going to be A, it's going to be all conference attendees. All conference members. E is making it, do not pick E's. I don't know what they're trying to test. So it's going to be A or B, we know that. Um, the population is now we have to figure out. So the population is all teachers in the state, or is the population all conference attendees? Now, the, we're going to go with B. Because um, I would just, this is a little, a little tricky to, to understand. Um, even though, you know, they want to, even though their goal is to figure out the average number of years teacher in the state have been teaching, um, for them to do this, you know, correctly, statistically speaking, you would have to, you know, randomly select 50 teachers from all the teachers in the state. Um, in this case, they only selected 50 from the ones that attended the conference. So it's not necessarily going to be representative of all the teachers in the state. I mean, it could be, but people can argue that the, the, the teachers that attend um, conferences are different than the average teacher. So um, our answer would be B. All right, so grain moisture is a characteristic of a grain that affects the price for the grain. A random sample of 28 loads of corn was evaluated for moisture as a percent of the total weight. A different random sample of 28 loads of soybeans was also evaluated for moisture. The data are displayed in the dot plots below. Interesting. Based on dot plots, which of the, which of the following is greater for the percent of moisture than for the percent of the moisture soybeans? So it looks like they want to break this into the um, uh, box plot, you know, first quartile, second quartile, third, fourth. So if there's 28 of them, each, this is a nice number divided into four, then we would, the first 20, the first quartile will be the first seven, the second quartile will be the next seven, and the, and the next seven will be the third quartile, so it would be seven, 14, 21, 28. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh one will be in here. So let's write quartile in here. So let's keep on going because we are not, um, not all the way through. So 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That'll be our second quartile. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And then the rest of that would be. So this would be Q1. This would be your median. This would be Q3. Same thing for the soybeans. Let's look at the first seven. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 will be over here. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. 
It looks like the older quartiles and the medians are are at the same values. They don't get as very specific. They or you can't tell which ones exactly, you know, are here. But it looks like they're all going to be if they're, in this case uh, eleven percent. So the first quartile is eleven percent for both. The median is fourteen percent for both. And the third quartile is sixteen percent for both. So it's not going to be any of these because they're, they're equal. Now let's look at the next one, the range. So the range for the corn would be from here to here. So that would be, that's seven, seven to 20. So the range would be 13. The range for the soybeans would be from eight to 20. Or no, so eight to 19. And then so that would be 11. So the range for the corn is greater. And that's what we're trying to find that, that would work. Our answer would be D. The inter, and their interquartile would be the same again, um, Q1 to Q3, that that's 11% to 16%. So for both of them would be 5%. So it wouldn't be E. So the answer is definitely D. Sleep time at 15.9 hours per day for newborn babies, 10 percentile of the distribution of sleep times for all newborn babies. Assuming the distribution is normal with standard deviation 0.5 hours, approximately what is the mean sleep time in hours per day for newborn babies? Okay, so um, let's, let's remind ourselves what the equation for z score is. So the z score equation would be you know, our, our data value minus the mean over the standard deviation. So if you want to, let's start by finding the z-score value for the 10th percentile of a newborn baby in this distribution. So in general, the, the z-value the z or standardized value for this 